The Khmeran threat began in Russia. The origin of the virus is unknown, but its effects were devastating and swift. In the 1930s, reports of biological experiments began leaking out of Russia. Then reports of villages destroyed overnight. Then entire cities. We feared the Russians had developed a weapon of unparalleled power. The truth was far worse. The Chimera stayed sealed within Russia for over a decade. Then, in 1949, they launched an attack that overwhelmed all of Europe in a matter of weeks. For several months, we thought England was safe. But in October of 1950, the Camaro burrowed under the channel. We had prepared for them, but in three months' time, the war was lost. We abandoned the cities to the Camaro and retreated to scattered military bases and outposts. The Camaro had won. On July the 11th, 1951, the Americans launched an assault on the eastern coast of England. On the second wave of that assault was a sergeant named Nathan Hale. The actions of that soldier have become a matter of both scrutiny and myth. What follows are the known events of his life from July 11th to July the 14th, the day he was last seen. had no idea what they would soon be facing. The US government had sealed its borders in 1950. Radio waves and newspapers became state property. Only the highest levels of their government knew the truth. The operation was an exchange. The Americans were bringing supplies and tanks into York. We were giving them our one secret weapon, something we could offer that they couldn't build themselves. I was the commander of the convoy team that was to meet the U.S. soldiers. We were ambushed in Manchester on the way to the rendezvous. There was no way to warn the Americans. They were on their own in York, fighting an enemy they knew nothing about. We never learnt exactly what happened there. All we know is that Nathan Hale was the sole survivor. No, no, no! No one knows exactly how Hale was infected by the Khmeran virus. Our only clue is a journal entry recovered from the body of a US medic. It says that he encountered a number of comatose soldiers in a dry creek bed. One of the soldiers, a sergeant, suddenly woke up. Unlike the other soldiers, his body had no wounds at all. The sergeant refused any kind of medical examination, insisting on catching up to the rest of the company. If that sergeant was in fact Nathan Hale, then he remains the only known person to wake up after being infected. Whether the Khmeran virus mutated within him or whether his body had an innate resistance to it remains a mystery. The Americans regrouped at an abandoned bus depot in southeast York. Under the command of a Captain Winters, they staged a daring tactical offensive. The Chimera had begun to close in on their position. If the Americans could secure the site, they would have a perfect landing zone and the battle would tip in their favor. Well fought. We might just hold this little piece of heaven. Tapazzini, bring those tanks in here and scrape out a landing zone. Sir! Incoming!
We know from the craters that the Chimera ended the battle by launching spires. There is no defense against a spire attack. By the time you see them in the air, it's already too late. After impact, the spires release swarms of crawlers. Literally thousands of them can come from a single spire. Whole cities have been infected in minutes. After the crawlers have done their work, the Chimeras send in carriers to collect the dormant victims. The role of the carriers is to transport infected humans to conversion centers. It's at these locations that the Chimeran creatures are born. Hale was brought to a conversion center in the town of Grimsby. My convoy team and I were imprisoned at the same location. We had been captured uninfected, so we were put in makeshift pens until they could infect us. Sergeant Hale, First Rangers. An American? We thought the Chimera stopped all of you in York. Chimera? Those creatures. Oh, you jammed it. I'm sorry, Hale. Looks like you'll have to find your own way out. I'll be in touch. Frequency 77.6. It was strange enough that a lone American soldier was walking around a Khmeran conversion center, but it was his eyes that were most disturbing. They showed unmistakable Khmeran traits. It was subtle, but it was there. Whoever Nathan Hale was, he wasn't entirely human. The conversion center was built on top of an old fish cannery. Networks of tubes transported the bodies from one stage of conversion to another. Once humans are infected by the Khmeran virus, they fall into a coma. The virus begins changing their bodies from the inside out, eventually turning them into one of the Khmeran creatures. The conversion centers simply speed up the process. During the second phase of the conversion process, the humans are wrapped in cocoons. This accelerates the final stages of the conversion. What emerges from the cocoon is determined by the strain of the virus. Each Khmeran creature is created by a separate strain. What we call hybrids, the ones that most closely resemble humans, have the shortest gestation period. The more beastly creatures take months to create and are made from multiple human bodies. The final stage of the Khmeran conversion process is known as the birthing chamber. The cocoons are opened and new chimera are born. In the case of hybrids, a cooling apparatus is fused into their bodies. The chimeran metabolism is roughly 12 times that of humans. This results in remarkable healing abilities, but also raises their body temperatures significantly. Without the cooling apparatus, the hybrids would overheat and die. I was able to make it to the surface and summon a rescue. Flying into the Khmeran territory was always dangerous, but we had to risk it. Hale made it out shortly after. I looked for any further signs of conversion. Fever, nervous movement, paranoia. There was nothing. Just the gold-colored eyes. We flew directly to Manchester. Soldiers had been trying to recover the convoy ever since my squad was ambushed. They knew what was in it. They knew it was our last hope for defeating the Chimera. I wanted to take Hale back to Northern Command for debriefing. Maybe he could sense I was suspicious of him. He joined the Manchester squad before I could say a word. The convoy was stranded on the west side of Manchester. The site was guarded by stalkers, so the only route in was on foot. A radio message from Hale's squad said they were entering Manchester Cathedral. The cathedral was a field hospital during the war. It was abandoned in a hurry and still had some supplies and ammunition. Unfortunately, it was also a breeding ground for some of the lower forms of Chimera.
hell, mate? You all right? Get in here! Captain Mitchell's squad had located the convoy. Unfortunately, stalker sightings in the area made immediate recovery impossible. The stalker is one of the Chimera's most feared weapons. They move quickly and fire anti-aircraft missiles with deadly accuracy. The technology used in the Stalker remains one of the most intriguing and frustrating mysteries of the Chimera. Mitchell had been fighting a losing battle most of the morning, holding out until reinforcements arrived. Meanwhile, the Chimera kept coming. To everyone on the ground, it seemed the convoy was all but lost. Mitchell to command. Site secure. All Stalkers down. You've got your convoy. How about getting us a sodding medic? Parker here. We're in round, Captain. Four minutes out. I picked up Hale after the mission. I had seen him approach the containment cell on the convoy. The cell had 14-inch lead walls, but even so, given Hale's condition, I didn't want him anywhere near it. With the stalkers gone, we were able to airlift the cell back to Northern Command. The exchange with the Americans would have to wait. We were about to execute a very risky offensive operation. The Chimera had been using a network of underground tunnels to attack undetected. The tunnels formed a nexus in Nottingham, and if we sealed them off, we would at least briefly have the upper hand. I was directing the battle from the air when I saw Cartwright's squad had run into heavy resistance. I needed to get them help right away. A group of soldiers had just stormed a Chimera mortar position. Hale was the only one to make it out. I radioed him to look for a shortcut through an old train tunnel. The tunnel was mostly blocked by a Chimeran power conduit, but I knew if Hale could find a way through, it would turn the tide of the battle. Lieutenant Cartwright, sir. If you've come looking for a fight, you've found the place. It seems the Chimera are up to something more than just digging tunnels. Say, look here, who brought the Yank? By that time, word had already spread about what Hale did in Manchester. However, Cartwright wasn't the type to be easily impressed, especially by an American. Cartwright's team had found something suspicious. Instead of just making tunnels, the Chimera were digging something out of the ground. At the time, we passed it off as just another Chimera in mystery. Our priority was to seal off the tunnels. The Nottingham operation was a success. I sent the troops back to Southern Command for a well-earned rest. I was taking Hale to the Intelligence Division at Northern Command for debriefing. I radioed Northern Command on our approach. No response. As we landed, I could already sense the worst. The whole place was deathly silent. trying to radio hell since the cave-in. I knew how the Chimera had found Northern Command, and more importantly, I knew why. They were after what the convoy had been carrying in Manchester. It had been carefully sealed in a specimen tank in our research lab. We thought it would be unable to call the Chimera from within the tank. We were badly mistaken. There was no way to warn Hale of the danger he was in. If he opened that tank, the result could be disastrous. What was inside would either kill him, or control him. I knew Hale would eventually find the map room. Everything we had learnt about the Chimera in the past two decades was in there. We had maps of the Chimera invasion spreading through Russia, autopsy records of Chimeran creatures, charts of the death tolls across Europe. These were numbers we didn't even disclose to our own soldiers. There were files that showed the progression of the Chimeran virus in humans. In over 6,000 cases, there were no records of any form of human resistance. 
There were also detailed schematics of our specimen tank and what was in it. We call them angels. They're the most powerful of all the Chimera. We believe the angels control other forms of Chimera via some form of telepathy. For all I knew, this one was already controlling Hale. up hope of him surviving when I saw Hale coming up in the lift I could tell from his face that he had found the angel there was no point in asking if he was alive then the angel was dead Hale was starting to show more effects of the conversion process his movements had the unnatural quickness of the hybrids judging from the bullet holes in his uniform he had acquired their healing capabilities as well we had tracked the Chimera leaving Northern Command to a gorge in Somerset. Cartwright led a squad of soldiers after them. It had been two hours since he had reported in. Hale volunteered to go after them. I expected he would locate Cartwright. There was no way I could have imagined what else he would discover in that gorge. Come on, we gotta move. Give it a moment. Cartwright was the best soldier in my command. Nothing got past him. He must have known Hale was infected when they first met in Nottingham. Fortunately, Cartwright never cared too much about the small stuff. The Chimera tend to establish themselves near large population centers. Their presence in a remote region like Somerset was highly unusual. The gorge was filled with factories that built stalkers and dropships, but we had seen those before. Deeper into the gorge, the Chimera were hiding something far more alarming. the key to the entire Khmeran strategy. The tower they found had not been constructed, it had been excavated. That single fact changed everything we knew about the Chimera. Leaving Somerset, they must have noticed the power conduits radiating from the tower behind them. We believe this discovery is what inspired Hale's fateful actions later that day. The drive to Southern Command would have taken at least an hour. Time enough for the Chimera to launch a strike force. The soldiers fought off the worst of the attack on the northern entrance, but we then faced a graver threat. The Chimera had infiltrated the hangar on the south side. If we didn't get the planes out safely, then all would truly be lost. Get to the hangar! Make sure all the transports get out! Soldiers were finally able to fight off the Chimera in the hangar. We ferried the survivors up to a rendezvous point in Cardiff, 20 miles west. I stayed at the base to finish loading what supplies we could. Chimeran Goliaths were already approaching Southern Command. A spire attack seemed inevitable. We've 
we've got scores to settle. Southern command was lost. More than half our troops were lost with it. If not for the heroism of Cartwright and Hale, many more would have been killed, myself included. We were flying the survivors to a makeshift camp in Cardiff. Despite my insistence, Hale refused to board the last plane. The last time I saw Hale, he was looking over a map Cartwright had given him. I learned later that it detailed the known paths of the power conduits. The conduits only run above ground for a short distance before burrowing deep into the Camaran tunnels. Entering those tunnels is nothing short of suicide. Nevertheless, I believe that is exactly what Hale did. We believe Hale followed the Camaran tunnels for several miles, finally reaching a major conduit junction. This would have led him directly into a Camaran tower. The tower was most likely what we now know as C3. Each tower is named for its relative position in the conduit network. C3 is only 12 miles from the center. It would have been exceedingly well defended. We had been at Cardiff for several hours when I received a radio message from Hale. He told me he was in London and he asked if snow was normal for July. He described a tower in the middle of London, one far bigger than that which they had found in Somerset, and with power conduits emerging in all directions. He said, if we destroy the tower, we destroy the Camara. For all I knew, Hale was completely mad. And even if what he was saying was true, we had no idea how to destroy the tower. But there was one new factor working in our favor. I had been able to contact the Americans, and they had joined forces with us in Cardiff. I decided to gamble that Hale was right. I convinced the Americans to help launch a full assault on the tower. We were bringing everything we had to London. I was counting on Hale to clear out a landing zone. If he couldn't take out the stalkers, the mission would be over before it began. I'm outside. Where are you? Right. We see you now. Be advised, Sergeant. We're going in heavy and a little low. arrived in London nearly unscathed. It was hard not to stare in awe at the tower. We had only fled London six months earlier, and now it was almost unrecognizable. The whole city was covered in snow. I knew the Chimera thrived in cold weather, but it was hard to fathom how they might actually be altering the climate itself. The power conduits, the snow, and the tower had to be related in some way. There was no time to think about it. Their armies were already guarding the tower, and more would be coming. We set the tanks up in assault formation and started across Tower Bridge. The last tanks were crossing the bridge when we saw Goliaths approaching from behind. We had to destroy the bridge before they caught up to our tanks. Hale and a few other soldiers took up defensive positions while the charges were being set. The outlook of the battle was growing bleaker by the second. Our tanks had killed legions of Chimera, but still they poured out of the tower. The Chimeran forces were holding us in check while their Goliaths closed in on Southwark Bridge. With Tower Bridge destroyed, there was no possibility of retreat. The team I sent to destroy Southwark Bridge was not responding. It would only be a matter of time before we heard the spires in the air.
could have used that. I know. I was only trying to disable it. Let's go. We have to catch that Goliath. Not bad shooting, I'd say. Considering I was hit and all. You, you go ahead. Uh, I'll uh, cover this entrance. battle outside the tower. The few tanks that remained would soon be overwhelmed by the seemingly infinite hordes of Chimera. Our only hope lay with the few soldiers who had managed to infiltrate the tower. It was up to them to find a way to destroy it from the inside. I think I found the power supply here, but it's just a bunch of glowing rods and cables. It must be some sort of a reactor. Can you tell if it uses isotope fission for its energy yield? What, are you kidding me? I just meant that if it's a nuclear reactor, it can be overheated. Uh, okay. You'll figure it out. And then, get out fast, okay? As the tower fell, Khmeran creatures began to shriek and writhe on the ground. They died within minutes. We believe they were simply unable to survive the loss of the Angels. The significance of our victory in London wasn't understood for several days. The reactor meltdown caused a chain reaction that destroyed all the towers in the network. At least in Britain, the Khmera were defeated. We have investigated the ruins of five towers so far. As we attempt to reverse engineer the complex technologies we find, the mystery of the Chimera only deepens. With combat subsided, the soldiers have been searching the rural villages for survivors. So far, we found 921 hiding in bunkers and basements, 78 of them children. Cartwright's youngest daughter, Angela, was among them. As for Nathan Hale, his body was never recovered. He was presumably incinerated inside the tower. The American military lists him as killed in action, July the 14th, 1951. A part of me still believes he might have escaped somehow. I even thought I heard his voice on the radio just after the tower exploded. I'll never know for sure.